Down the field, Hollywood! Let me think about that one. 77 yards! Whoa! Who is this kid? Let's do it. All right, guys, welcome back to the Steve Weatherford Show. We got an extra special guest uh, here this week, a guy that I connected with about six weeks ago. I've been following on social media uh, for about eight months, and we were introduced um, through the pastor of my church. This guy speaks all over the world. Uh, he's got a book that's coming out very, very soon. Uh, we're going to talk about everything from family um, to athletics to pursuing your goals to overcoming adversity uh, creating a life worth living um, and without further ado I want to introduce a, a dear friend of mine and a guy that has been really kind of a spiritual mentor of mine um, over the last three or four weeks a guy a lot I have a lot of uh, respect and admiration uh, for and his name is Rex Crane Hey, thank you for having me. Thank no, you guys so much. I'm excited. So we're, we're here, and, um, and I wanted to make sure that, that my wife was a part of this because she is really um, what balances me out and makes my life worth living. The family that we've created, um, you know, the businesses that we've created, the freedoms that we've created, and, um, and the kids that we have created has made our life uh, worth living. But I wanted to, her to be able to ask some questions because she sees people in a completely different uh, perspective and vantage point uh, of the way that I do. So I, I want to make sure that um, I acknowledge how much you mean to me, babe, because I know you're going to make this interview so much more impactful for so many other people because not everybody responds to um, exactly what I respond to. Your brain works completely differently uh, than mine, so I'm stoked that you're here with us. And, and for the people that are listening and watching, my wife has agreed uh, to do these shows every time we have a special guest, as long as it's not on the road, that my wife is going to take part in this. And uh, she is full on committed. And she's on Instagram killing the game. Um, so, babe, I'm just really glad you're here. Rex, I'm really glad you're here. And um, I'm really excited to, uh, to get my hands on one of, your, one of your books here pretty soon. Tell us, first of all, before we go backtrack and we talk about the younger years of, of Rex and where you came from, what you had to do in order to get in the chair that you're in right now. Tell me a little bit about this book. Uh, this book, you know, the title of it's called Do Different, When the Usual's Not Working Anymore. And I, you know, I think so many of us are, so many great people that I know are caught in a fog of ritual and routine. And they relive the Groundhog's Day experience over and over. And their spirit cries out for adventure, more than money, passion, energy, they want to feel fully alive. And so many of us get caught ordering the usual. We go, we go to the same haircuts, the same styles of food, the same kind of dates, do the same thing, but yet we want something different. I was in a Starbucks one time and the barista behind the bar it was like about six in the morning. I just got done traveling and I was like half asleep and the lady goes, Rex, would you like the usual? And I was about three people deep from the front. And I, I thought, man, maybe I'm just hearing things. I, maybe I didn't really hear her right, so I didn't respond. And then about maybe about 30 seconds, 60 seconds, she went by, she goes, Rex, would you like the usual in her little Hispanic voice? And then finally everybody looked at me. I'm like, no, I want different. Because I thought in my mind, if I become that predictable that people right. already, already know what I'm going to order. And I thought, man, for things to become different, I got to become different. And I began to really see that our similarity to things and to ourselves and people, it creates comfort, but only doing different creates your rewards. So... So take me back, at what point did you realize in your life that this book was something that people would want and need to listen to? Powerful question. Um, you know, I, I wrote my first book. It did really, really well. It did New York Times thing, and it did really, really well. It was trying to get a book out there that had a lot of phenomenal information in it mm -hmm. that you can empower people and touch people. This, I think, is a lot more insightful because as we're going, so many things have changed in lifestyle and times, politics, a lot of things around them, and people feel out of control. And so I wanted to get something into someone's hands that people can immediately take charge and create something different, carve out something different that they'll live rewarded for. Mm -hmm. What I found was so many people live unrewarded for the difference they contain. 
they feel like I got to jump on that bad wagon to have their results. I got to jump on this train of thought. I got to follow that leader. Then I'm going to, it's all going to make sense. But there's something about every human being that makes them different. There's 7.4 billion people on the planet. Not everyone's got the same fingerprint, eye scan. And yet we study our similarities, but it creates a cage for it. It tames and domesticates, I think, so many dreams and so much difference. And when I started discovering my own self, what made me different, that as long as I invested in that, developed it and cultivated that, I would live rewarded and celebrated for what I contained rather than trying to copy and produce something I'm not. That changed the game, and I thought, how many, how much is needed about that right now? Whether you're in the, in the, the game of trying to make more money, you're trying to create a business, you're trying to be an entrepreneur, you're trying to build a great family. I want to know what makes me different, and I want to be able to maximize that, mm -hmm. so it can really enrich the quality of my life, and I can really take maybe op optimize ownership of my own life and live rewarded for what I contain. And to me, that was like, as I talk to people and millions of people across the board, that's what I see. Most people feel like. Okay, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And we're in a world with so many great strategies. Right. You can get so many great strategies, right? Business, relationship. We're talking earlier. Mm -hmm. I was talking to your wife. She's brilliant. She's got all these phenomenal, you know, strategies. We talk different ideas, business, marketing strategies. But you can do all that, but yet you can lose the person and you become so robotic. And I like to come back to the place of, wait a second. There's something about me that makes me different. Yeah, so... Starting from your from your because that's the one of the reasons that I was able um, to get turned on to you was going to our church that's here in uh, North San Diego. It's called C3 Church and our pastor, uh, Dr. Matt, um, after getting an opportunity uh, to speak with him a little bit. And, you know, he heard my athletic background. He's like, man, you are absolutely uh, going to love Rex Crane. This guy's a, like every single time he says your name, it's quickly followed by powerhouse and and anointed um so i really want the the listeners and and the viewers on youtube to get a snapshot of like the 14 the 14 year old rex crane the athlete and take us up through um the story of of meeting your wife because this story is so powerful okay well thank you very much you know uh i don't know if it was similar to you and this would be interesting at 14 i was a driven i knew i was good at baseball Mm -hmm. And so I invested in it. It was like a crossroads. Hey, I'm probably not going to make it to the NBA, even though I like to play <laughs> basketball. I found out that I was probably not going to exceed 6'1". And uh, the odds of making it probably weren't going to work out. Football was an option, but I was really good at baseball. So I said, I'm going to harness this and really focus on it. So I was the kid that was up at 6 in the morning, you know, throwing the ball against the wall, working on taking ground balls or becoming good at what I could become good at. And it allowed me to really excel beyond other kids that were probably maybe even a little more talented than me, but I was more committed and developed. And I think that commitment only accelerated the passion and the energy by which I was doing it because I felt alive. You know, there's a proverb that says, you know, desire fulfilled is life to your soul. And the more I fulfilled these things and worked at it, it was like more life felt my soul. That led me into 18 years of age and I was able to sign with the Boston Red Sox. Uh, I signed- Straight out of high school. Straight out of high school, I did. Uh, signed a Hall of Famer, Joe Stevenson, signed me to a contract. And, wow. you know, you go from sleeping with my glove, watching guys like Roger Clemens, Jose Canseco on my wall and posters to being in the same locker room and, mm -hmm. you know, having that happen. That was a surreal moment. And it was a great moment in baseball. Cal Ripken was still playing before the strike. So baseball was still had this real neat nostalgia of it. And so going in there, I thought, you know, you know, it's amazing. I don't know if you had this experience in football, but your head just goes, oh my goodness, I can conquer here. I'm the greatest yeah, ever. Yeah, my wife yeah. got to experience that <laughs> happening to me because she met me uh, when I was on my official visit uh, to the University of Illinois. I was getting recruited. So I was in the first semester of my senior year and she's four months older than me, but she was already in college. And she she met me. And since you know we obviously have talked about that time and she was drawn to my confidence and so really my question is for you babe what do you think it is in, in your opinion that is it innate the confidence and the ambition that that people like rex and i have or is that something that's mm. is that a learned behavior or do you feel like that's a gift that god places on people i think that it's a gift god places i think it can be like you can hone in on it. And I think some people are given the gift and they don't even realize it. 
but I think some people are given it and they take it and they run with it. Mm -hmm. So both of you were ones that took it and were like, oh yeah, I'm gonna love this, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. It's like also obsessive. like, it's almost obsessive. Like you can say committed, and I think committed is a great, nice word. My husband was obsessive. Yeah, like, was. Is, but for football, was. I'm obsessed with you. <laughs> but don't you think that, that that's what allows a person to take what's possible, but then makes it like, okay, this is my new, re this is, you yeah. identify with it, this be, it. Well, it's because you believed it was possible you in be it. before you anybody in, in, in the container of your life and your ecosystem had even thought about it. So you had such a, a strong conviction that mm -hmm. not even that it's possible, almost kind of like, well, if it doesn't happen, it'll be weird. Like you have, you're, you're obsessed uh, and your confidence grows the more you work towards your goal. But I, I truly believe that the people that are born with that drive and that ambition, as long as they surround themselves with like the wife that you surround yourself with now and your obsession to do a completely different um, task, mm -hmm. if, you, if we can call it that, your task in life and your goal and your purpose in life is completely different. You know, you're not entertaining people. You're impacting and inspiring people. Um, but for me, it's it's the same thing. Like I was absolutely obsessed with my goals. And that's why, you know, we, we kind of changed the studio around. And a lot of the goals that I had when I was 14 years old, not a lot of them, I had four of them. And I've achieved every single one of them. Um, but I never, ever would have been able to achieve those if God wouldn't have placed her in my life when he did. Yeah. Because I was I was sporadic. I was... I was pinballing all over the place because I was constantly chasing things that made me feel good versus staying on target. And I was absolutely obsessed with that goal, but I was pinballing around and it wasn't, it was like a shotgun. And then when I met my wife, I became a sniper rifle, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not supposed to I was it, always, yeah. <laughs> I was always doing damage. I was always busy because I've got ADHD so bad. So I was always doing damage. But now my damage is concentrated. Do you think that anything your parents did helped, or do you think it was all in you? Because as a parent, I'm wondering that. Like yeah, my, what was your house? like? My son has so many gifts that were given to him, but like that, like hard work and drive has not been instilled in him at this point. I would like to probably honor my mom and my dad by saying this. They provided a home. We were lower income, but not lower class. Mm -hmm. They provided stability. And I think that stability released a lot of ability. Now, you might, people that are listening to us, they go, well, maybe I didn't come from a home like that. I came from a home of brokenness. I came from a home of divorce. I came from a home of abuse or alcoholism or some type of mm -hmm. a challenge that way. And you say, well, how's that going to help me? You know, you had a little bit of a different upbringing. I think that, you know, somebody can always raise their level of commitment, how, what they're going to stand for. And they mm -hmm. can say, this is going to stop with me. And that person could yeah. do that even at, no matter what age of life and say, that might have happened up to now. But from now on, this is the way it's going to be for my life. There's a new resolve. But for me, I think the stability happened with we had a room to where we didn't talk about failure and winning. We talked about being excellent. Mm. We talked about showing up and using that. And I saw that in my dad modeled. I think he was a great visual that turned an idea is life's about what you can give to people, not what you can get. And so even growing up and seeing that my dad was a he was a pastor. He served people. He made a life out of serving people and enriching other people. And it wasn't glamorous. It wasn't like what's out there today where some of the, like, you know, the you church drive, you're world's a, on You're TV, a pastor that okay. drives a Mercedes. No, 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 no. He was busting his butt to help other people live up in a down world. So the respectability in the work side was if you've been entrusted with something, you have a gift, a dream, a passion, a desire. You can obsess about that because you can only become good, I think, where you're obsessed, where you're that tunnel right. visioned on right. that. But the challenge with that probably you guys saw in your own world is you major on your majors and then you have all these other areas of your life and I'm only good in one area of my life. Right. I've experienced that. Like I didn't hardcore, see that. Man. I didn't see that till later on. I no, well, I'm well, experiencing I, that I right wasn't now. Like that. I actually wasn't like that. I don't think I was ever really obsessed with anything, which is why I like, Thanks a lot, babe. Well, you know what I mean? Like outside. <laughs> I'm anyway. pandering. I'm pandering for love over here in the corner. <laughs> pandering for love. I was obsessed with you from the time I met you. Um, but in general, in general, with like how you were obsessed with um, football and things of that nature, mm -hmm. like I wasn't like that. I didn't have. As a matter of fact, I was the opposite of that. I was always like, "Ugh, I have to do this," and I was like good mm -hmm. at everything I did, but I was never obsessed. You are with it. exactly like our daughter Ra. 
we have a daughter uh, that we named Aurora, and its nickname, her, her nickname right now is is Rara, and it will never change. <laughs> but every single thing she does, she's good at. It is, it's unbelievable. Piano, ballet, you know, reading. Like she's just everything she tries, she's good at, and that's like my wife. But it, I was but, never obsessed with any. So I never like got to that point where I was like the best. You've in the been world obsessed with our business for eight months. Well, and our not, business is crushing the best it. in the world. <laughs> well, it's not like I just got obsessed with football and I was the best in the world eight months later. But you've been obsessed with our business and we are crushing the game. Maybe though, maybe a better word then is not obsessed. Maybe it's so passionately focused. When you become passionate about something, there's a lot more detail given to it. There's a lot more harness yeah. your ability. You put care, you put preparation, you put a lot of pre-thought. How do we teach this? How do you teach that? This is that? the secret I need to know. How Babe, I... you're obsessed with our family. <laughs> I'm obsessed with our family. I want to teach. I want to instill that in my kids. What would you want them to know? That they are capable of doing anything if they really want to do it. So I think you're this greatest source of inspiration and leadership in their life. So, you know, you're constantly using your mouth to create their world. Right. They value your opinion more than anybody else. And God put you as someone, you know, the guy that was a king in the Bible, David, he says, they're like arrows inside of a, a, a bow and you can shoot them wherever you want. That's okay. incredible responsibility. Most people shoot their, were shot or their mm -hmm. parents maybe shot them at, hey, we're just, just, we're average or we're enough or we don't expect too much. And you have the ability to say, oh my goodness, I got these destinies on my hand mm -hmm. right. that they think 30,000 to 45,000 thoughts a day. Those children laugh and smile over 300 times a day versus adults that do that four to six times a day. Mm -hmm. And you have the ability through my words and my modeling and my actions to shoot them at the all things are possible network. That's one thing, that's one shift we've made in our family in probably four months ago is, is coaching our children into um, really kind of just discontinuing average language like we don't allow our and it's not just can't it's it's want we don't we don't say want you know if it, if it's something that you want work for it you know what i mean so it will happen we don't say can't we don't say uh want mm -hmm. hope wish because those are implying that it's not possible was that different than when you were brought up yeah for sure i mean when i was brought up i and my parents were very similar to yours like so like amazing amazing parents um so I, I definitely want to acknowledge them for that. But they, they're they very content. My parents are very content people. Wouldn't you say, babe? Yeah, and I don't think, I don't, and this is, see, I'm doing my, my typical, like I don't ever want to make anyone. Yeah, it's like, I think. That well, they, I think it's important. Like, I mean. They, they're content. They're very, as long as like. They had all their needs met. Like they were happy. Like, yeah. And I can't, when you say content, I I don't often think people see that as happy. I do find that your parents are happy. Like they're happy with their lives. They're they, they make the best. My parents have done an extraordinary job of making the best out of what they have. And the 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 reason I didn't really feel like I don't want to say this the wrong way. Not that I didn't fit into my family, but I didn't fit into my family. Um, I, I never wanted to just, well, this is good enough because I'm obsessed. So, and that's also one of the reasons I've struggled with addiction in my life. Um, I addicted to exercise, uh, addicted to, to women, addicted to gambling, addicted to alcohol, like you name it. If it made me addicted to winning, if it made me feel good, I couldn't get enough of it. Mm -hmm. I was, I was an addict and and now it's been amazing since she's come into my life. She's able to mirror me to me. And it's made me so much more um, laser focused, so much more capable, uh, so much more confident. But, but also at the end of the day, it's made me much more well-rounded, not because she's the gap filler for me, because she helps me see where the gaps in my life are. But if I could say this, like in just the, you know, the time that we've gotten to know each other, one thing that really impressed me, I think, and I think I actually told this to you, 
was not only you're a massive achiever and you are crushing it on so many different levels and people are talking about what you guys are doing everywhere mm. which is cool thank you so when you go to meet somebody like this you don't know if they're going to be okay they want to just talk about their incredible highs what they've done and you know you have a good stock of all that but what i love was you're emotionally available and you're vulnerable you cared about people and it was a constant theme it wasn't let me just show this one side and that side i think is you know the quality of someone's life is what they're alive to mm -hmm. and if you're only alive to being obsessed in this one area because i got to create this business i got to create this part of my life i got to do this that's cool, but when someone's emotionally available and they're present and they're having a conversation and they're really engaged in improving or enriching someone's thought process or they're adding value to someone, to me, that's one of the most amazing qualities, just having that kind of vulnerability, like I don't have to just hide behind this mannequin version that I got everything in my life all together and I'm not able to show some of the best parts of myself. Well, I think, uh, thank you, I accept that. Um, and, and it means a lot to me one of the ways that I was really able to like gain this self-awareness was by realizing what I'm doing isn't the most important thing in the world. Like there are so many people out there who whether, whether their, their, their struggles are public or they're private, when I grew into the confidence of sharing what I'm not good at, sharing what I struggle with, sharing my addictions, sharing things that happened to me uh, when I was a child that give me nightmares. When I grew into that confidence, the the impact and the influence and and the tribe of people that my wife and it, and I have been able uh, to build are are genuinely people that that know us now. Because it's easy to become successful and then hide all of those things because they're not marketable or hide all those things because they don't make you look more attractive or more successful. I'm not trying to be more attractive or more successful. I'm trying to be more impactful. And if right. I want to be more impactful, I need to give them the real McCoy. I need to, I need to keep it 100 with every person that I meet. And it's a daily struggle for me because my impulse is to be the conqueror and to be the, the best in the world. But at the end of the day, like, that's not who I am. That's what I did. And, and my wife has really helped me to, to, to grow into that confidently. Rex, you actually said that to me, the alpha man. So go, I, I want you to finish the story. You're playing baseball, Boston Red Sox. What happened? Yeah, I was so playing. You're an alpha man. No, I was playing. I made it. I, I, I thought I'd made it to where I had. I was at Major League Spring Training. I was 18 years old. And, you know, you're living a fantasy. Right. And something that I lived in, I think it was it's just a matter of before it happened, it was just going to happen in time because I was already committed to the process. So I always felt like that's going to happen because this is who I am. It's not something right. I'm trying to get. It's just who I am. I got there and I, I remember going my second year. I, I was playing. I got hurt my first year. My second year, I was on my way to spring training. And um, I had a real moment where I, two nights prior to spring training, I, I had knelt down. It was 8.44 p.m., I remember on a Tuesday night and I said, God, if you're real, I want you to do something special in my life. I want a relationship with you. I, 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 if I was, you're real, I really want that. It was amazing that all the achievement and things you talked about, you know, couldn't fill that area of, you know, that, that, that vote that, and there wasn't emptiness of like success or money or anything, but it was just, there's gotta be more than this. You had it all, but you didn't yeah, have anything. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And I know the feeling, man. Oh, it's like a, yeah, like this little, it wasn't like you're poor, beat you know what up, it, tore The up. best way to describe it to me is you have the, the, the shoes of your dreams, but there's a rock inside of your sock. You know what I mean? Like you, you love these shoes. You've always <laughs> wanted these shoes and you're walking around, but there's this tiny, tiny little rock. And every time you take a step, it bothers you and you can't yeah. figure out what the heck it is or you know what no. I mean? And I, I that's think that, what it is. That that I was think, the feeling to me. Every step I took was yeah. a was a reminder that I had what I always wanted, but it didn't feel right. I think it's with divine dissatisfaction. I think that's the way I would term it. that's a really good metaphor because that's what it was. So I remember praying that that night and, and I that was it. I, I got it on my plane two days later, go to spring training. And the 76 year old woman sat in the middle aisle, in the middle row, I was in the aisle. And then her husband was on an oxygen machine, was against the window and he fell asleep. 
and I was maybe about about 45 minutes into my plane flight. It's like a five and a half hour flight, whatever. She taps me on my shoulders. I remember listening to my Walkman, listening to Guns N' Roses, and had a big dip in my mouth of Copenhagen. <laughs> and my she, kind of guy. And she goes, she goes, can I talk to you? And I, you know, I'm sure, she's a grandmother. I'm going to be very polite and cordial. I said, yes, ma'am. I tried to hide my spitter and whatever. And she goes, um, I want to tell you a message. You're going to change millions of people's lives all over the world, and there's millions of people in the delivery room that you're going to help set free. And I said, bless your heart. I think you got the wrong person. <laughs> I think you're looking for someone in 17A or in 24, D, C, and E. Uh, she goes, no, I got the right person. And she had this raw, strong Texas accent. And her eyes pierced through my soul. And the word terminology I would use, it'll sound Christian when I use it, but I want to use the terminology. She prophesied me blind. She made me blind for about four hours to everything I thought was my reality. And the more she talked a world that was inside me began to exist and come more conscious and aware of a world that didn't exist. But the more she talked, it had to exist and it had to be created. And the more she talked, it felt like things were unearthed. Things became alive. Things started jumping inside of me that were totally different than the course I was going, the aim I had. And it made me think of life. It deepened my sphere of concern, but it broadened my sphere of vision. All what she was communicating. This woman didn't leave me alone. She was the nicest woman, so I couldn't like turn her off. I got off the plane thinking, oh, bless her heart. Now what do I do with all this stuff? Every week, she would write me a letter. And she would say, don't quit. There's millions of people waiting for you. Don't quit. People are depending on you. And her letters began to emotionally affect me. And I'm like, oh my goodness, God's using this woman to stir me up about my future. And I was comfortable where I was, even though I was obsessed, I was comfortable with it. I knew what to do. It's amazing when you become uncertain because you're so used to doing something one way and the idea of doing different, but significance is tied to your difference. I begin to start seeing, oh my goodness, there's something about me that makes me That's different. That's powerful. Significance is tied to your difference. I, I started looking at success is just tied to doing working disciplines, but significance is tied to me being different. And most people, and this is maybe a teaching point, I started studying myself. What makes me different? What do I love? What do I love to think about? What do I love to learn about? What do I love to read about? And then I started thinking about what do I hate? Well, I was always told, don't you dare hate. But I thought about it. Hate is anger. It's fuel. What I hate, I feel we're supposed to most called the correct, bring change to. And then I started thinking about well, what draws compassion out of me? What makes me cry? What makes... What makes me cry? Is it watching a kid with getting their cleft lip healed in the middle of the night on a PBS special, hitting the channels after ESPN Sports Center, or is it, you know, walking by someone that's handicapped, or is it abused women, or is it people that have been sexually, you know, hurt, or people with cancer? And I started seeing like there was these patterns, and I'd wa and I I'd, I'd get really emotional. It affect me, and I'm like, there's a reason God is allowing me to feel this in my heart, and if I start to pay attention to some of the signs. These difference leaves clues. Mm -hmm. And if it draws the compassion out of me, I'm assigned to heal it. If it makes me angry and really angry at it, I'm not called to fight against somebody. I'm called to correct and do something about the situation. Mm -hmm. If I love it and it makes me alive and it impassions me and I can never get away from it, I got to invest in it because that's destiny talking to me. And I began to discover through this woman's little letters and she'd write me one verse from the Bible. She'd say, don't quit. You have a due season coming to you. If you don't give up in this moment, she would say the favor of God's on your life. Mm. You don't deserve it, but it's yours. Aww. She would say, you know, God takes shaky people and gives them sturdy projects and sturdy oh, things. Man, that's good. He knows you're weak, but he knows he's strong. Don't quit on it. Just wow. because you're in process and just because you're aware of all your weakness, don't let it talk you out of your greatness. All of a sudden, that changed the game for me. And I started thinking in terms of when this woman would write, this focus changed from what could I create? Who could I be? What, do I, what mask do I have to put on? Mm -hmm. How do I hold myself? Right. You know the game. You have to play part of the game in business life because mm -hmm. you don't show everybody your true colors. Right. At the same token, I started caring more about, okay, this is all cool. I'm going to do really good here. Okay, what can we give here? How can we improve these people? What can we do to help those kids? Or all of these other ideas started stimulating and forming in me and it was much bigger than the life I was living. Mm -hmm. and More it brought, meaningful. And it was. And it brought me to a crossroads and 
I asked for some real signs. And I said, if this is going to be, I'm going to have to walk away from everything I thought was reality. So I did this over about a year, almost a year. So l- let me pause you. So when you prayed yeah. at 844 uh-huh. that, that God will give you a sign, a when that went, when that, when that old lady on that flight, on March 7th, on March 7th started to, to share with you what she saw in you, did that how long did it take you to realize that was the did that download right? instantly like this is this is god like god's given me a sign through this woman or did it take time did it take a whole bunch of letters it did it was an initial sign but i think it grew a time because i didn't see how that could all work now mm. see and i'm a now guy i want to always be maximized now and i didn't understand that okay you know, you don't think in terms when you're 19 years old, 18 years old, you're not thinking in terms of when you're 35. So you're thinking, oh, how does that fit into now? Well, maybe when I get to it, but her consistency with me, nobody even knew her name except for heaven and her husband, this little grandma. And I've been able to, you know, speak to a little over, you know, 20 million plus people. Uh, and this little, did you know, this little woman that would take guts and risk, guy with tattoos, shaved head, you know, totally unorthodox from where she had probably grown up and handled herself. But the more she talked like this world, I didn't, I didn't want to get out of, I wanted to live in that world. Mm -hmm. And so her consistency allowed this world to kind of really come alive to it. It brought me to a place of what do I do? Do I walk around away from everything that's known? And what happens? Where do I go? What do I do? Someone going to hire me? How do I make money? How do I create? And I had a couple experiences where like I, I really prayed and said, okay, if this is, you know, I need some pity to really help me with this decision. And some people came and they did that. And so I walked away. I'm going to cut a long story short. I walked away. I fired my agents, walked away from all my contracts. And I went and worked in a church as a janitor for $5 an hour. As you know, it's a big financial difference between playing professional baseball. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you really found out real quickly who really liked you and who didn't based on how well you could perform or who you could be to them or what they liked. And for making $5 an hour, people, I found out I didn't have a lot of friends. It was always built around who I, what I was doing, not who I was. Mm. And they, I tried to go speak somewhere because I felt like I had something to say to someone. I didn't even know I didn't know you what to say. You had to start somewhere. And I tried to go teach in the kids department at the church, but they said you cuss too much. So they wouldn't <laughs> let me. <laughs> so if one flies out today, give me grace. But what I say is this, I, they finally let me start with like the kindergartners because they thought like he can't go too wrong with the kindergartners. I think they told me to teach him like Jonah and the whale, but I think you should teach him like about free Willy and Flipper and stuff like that. Listen, you're, you're sitting you, in my studio yeah. right now and I'm a Christian <laughs> and you're sitting in front of a Dr. Drake, yeah. a Dr. Drake poster, Listen, NWA. Ain't like, nothing but a G thing, baby. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> loped out. You got me I crazy. think for the people listening, like being a Christian doesn't mean being a Christian doesn't mean that you don't cuss, yeah. that you've never done drugs, that you don't drink, that you don't yeah. have sex when you're you're not married. Like, I'm going to pause out from, from the storytelling to you. Yeah. What is a Christian? Christian to me is I've embraced what Christ did for me, that he loved me enough that when I was an enemy of his, he was willing to give his life for me. He had done nothing wrong, and he was willing to reconcile me to a place of having a relationship with God. He's everything, because it's a foundation. In every other relationship in my life, I have to prove myself, and I have to love everybody. And it's based on usually if I like you, I like you, then I'm going to invest more in you. And you have to work for people's love. It's the only relationship I've ever come into that when I'm at my best and I'm at my worst, his love has never changed. And that love is removed in security inferiority it's given me the privilege to accept myself and consider myself a miracle even in the messes that i've made and it's brought so much healing into my soul my body my life and it's given me a future that not only affects what i do now but a future that will last forever because man was created to live forever so that relationship has created a well i only think an invention's as good as its inventor and most people spend their whole life trying to play hard to get with their inventor and they wonder why they're malfunctioning because only the wow. mind of the inventor could create the invention. Wow. And going and reconciling to my source, it was never about joining a church. I don't go to church all the time. It wasn't about performing right. It was embracing the life of Christ. And I found it as I studied religion, it was the only relation, religion that I ever came across in my studies that said, I'll love you and give everything for you and I don't expect anything in return except for receiving it. 
and that changed my life because that was always I had to work for you. I could work hard enough. I could prove this. I could prove that. And it was the one relationship I just had to accept. But accepting that love has melted away so much pain and so much insecurity and has given me confidence to enjoy myself and be myself when I'm at my best and even when I'm at my worst. That's powerful. Was there a time during kind of the story that you just described to us, walking away from a pro career that you had worked essentially your entire life up until that point yeah. to achieve that and then taking a job for $5 an hour as a janitor <laughs> I at don't church. recommend that, by the way. <laughs> was there ever a time that you started to to doubt God's plan or started to question your faith of a, whether a or not you're, you're, yes. you're making the right decision? So I kind of teed you up from that because I'm assuming, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But how how do you work through that and stay down the path that that you chose to go down, mm -hmm. you know, pursuing your faith versus pursuing yeah. a career? Yeah, and it, to me it wasn't like, okay, I'm just going to go and just become this faith monk. I, I didn't think about that. I thought I was on a destiny chase. Mm -hmm. I know Jay-Z always talked about the paper trace, but I was on a destiny chase. Mm -hmm. And I felt like destiny had ordered things for me. And so I always knew that destiny, even with baseball, was a process. Mm -hmm. You have a promise that brings hope and expectation, and you're alive with that promise. When you're working that process, there's days you don't do good. There's days where you fail. There's days when there's promises made to you that are unkept. There's days where you get hurt. There's days where there's injuries. So I think I adopted the same process because wisdom is not just living in a moment. It's living, it's, it's living not just for this moment. I think it's engaged in a process of I'm doing it long term and I'm going to know what I'm committed to. So the same way I made a decision that I'm going to be passionate and commit to building a world around baseball, I'm going to build a world around getting the insights, the tools to help people think different, choose different, engage different, and bring hope and help to people in significant ways that matter to me. And so I knew it was going to be a process. And it helped me because if I started to think about, okay, everything you go through, there's a big financial jump. People thought I was stupid for doing it. It didn't make sense. And I had some real serendipity moments because six and a half, seven months after being a custodian, a janitor, I had a friend of mine who was a paramedic and he said, hey, do you mind uh, coming with me? I'm going to go to an event out in uh, North Carolina. And I went with him. And uh, we were just walking down the street, true story. And all of a sudden, three vehicles, three or four vehicles, um, pitched out black windows, everything, pulled up alongside of me, and the windows were down with police escorts. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. And the guy rolls down the window, and he's one of the leaders of the free world. And he goes, who are you? I go, who are you? And I was thinking in my mind going, oh, my gosh, I hope I paid my taxes. Because <laughs> I was freaked out. We were walking in the middle of Raleigh, North Carolina. Right. And it was a major leader in the world. And he goes, I'm driving by, and God told me to have dinner with you. Who are you? No way. True story. Wow. What I did not know, I was a janitor. I was a baseball player and study stuff in the world. He was doing the peace process at that time between Israel and the Middle East. I went and had dinner with this man, and three weeks later, I flew in on a private jet in the part of the peace process. In, um, I was in Amman, Jordan, and then I was in Tel Aviv, Israel. Wow. Life That's can bizarre. change in a moment. That is bizarre. Life can change in a moment, but you don't know when those moments are going to hit. The word moment comes from a word, an atom, which is the smallest particle of an element. Tough to see, tough to understand. It's kind of like one day or one hour in the course of your whole life if you live 80 plus years. It's a small little thing. But the word moment also comes from the word atom or atomic. So atom is small. Atomic is explosive. How does what's small become rapidly powerful and explosive and dynamic when it's fused with massive energy and concentration of power? And I want to say that because it's so true. Most people have faith to try something but not committed to how it's going to end up. Mm. And one thing I could say is I saw modeled to me and I made the decision. I wasn't committed to starting something. I was committed to the end. So if that takes 20 years, if that takes 15 years, if that takes uh, three months, it didn't matter. And you're going to have these highs and lows amongst the journey. I wanted to get to the end where I could hear, well done, good, faithful son, child. You kicked butt on the planet. You made a difference. You made made a difference yeah you could have taken an easier route but you chose destiny over comfort that was my commitment so whether the highs or lows were like a freaking you know <laughs> a thing that would manage people's hearts and us and uh, i didn't care about that what i wanted to do was get to a place where this is i lived out what i was committed to babe what are you experiencing when he's talking just now i want that 
I want to find that thing. So tell like me more. Committed to, regardless. So for you personally. Mm-hmm. Tell me more. Let's talk about it. I don't know. Why that's where I'm at. I don't know what that is. Well, let's talk about it. What do you think it could be? I have no idea. She doesn't like it when I put her on the spot. She, I but don't like it when she puts me on the spot. She is so powerful that she doesn't. Uh, you don't embrace that, you know. One of these days, you're going to wake up and you're going to look in the mirror and feel as powerful as the way other people experience you. That's deep. Screaming baby. What if That's we put? What if we put now. it? Into, what if we put it into this terminology? I asked this question to a CEO of a Fortune five company not long ago. I said, "What deserves you?" It's a question of wealth and a question of worth. What deserves you? Most people have a tough time answering that question, what deserves them. But then they think about like how much time just evaporates and eludes our grasp from us maximizing it, investing in it, because we never made a decision what we're about or what deserves us. Mm -hmm. So we dabble with things, we flirt with things, we try things. You see this all the time. And, but you'll say, this is what deserves me. So then therefore, you, it's constantly like my daily life. And if I don't understand or define what deserves me, it's a day being responded to your whims. You're just a slave to your whims. What if somebody's listening to this right now like and they don't? I feel like that's how I live, though. That's how you live, too. What do you mean? A slave to your whims. Like, that's, I think yeah, that's Yeah, but sometimes I, 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 I genuinely do feel that some of my whims are, like, given to me. Like, like my whim for I'm in my 10th year in the NFL and I have, you know, millions of dollars in front of me and just choosing to walk away versus being told you're not good enough or you're not healthy enough or et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I could have plugged away another five, six, maybe 10 years in the NFL. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a whim because there's not been one day that I've woken up since that decision that I actually, it wasn't even, it was the day after, it was the day um, JJ was born that I knew that or the day after JJ was born when I got in that car wreck that I knew that I was not walking the, the path that was meant for me anymore. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to somebody who's listening to this right now Yeah, who doesn't feel deserving of exactly sure. like, remember my wife said, I want that. Yeah. What, a, what would you say to somebody listening or watching this right now that doesn't feel like they're ever going to find that or that they deserve that? I think the question of worth comes from, and that's what's really helped me with my faith, is seeing that from the relationship side, that I'm worth, that I was created. I was created with something to live significant for. That God truly does get more glory out of my success and significance than he does out of my failure and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. right. And most of the days for humans, and I've had this true in my own life at times, very monotonous and you don't see the significance in what you do because part of it's the process. But I don't I think at the same time, if they say in business, what doesn't get dated doesn't get done. Whatever doesn't get clearly defined. Ooh, that's good. That what I'm about, what happens is I don't know have a foundation now or what deserves me to allocate my decisions, where to put time, energy, and resources. And so for me, what really happened was um, waiting for just some special thing to fall out of the sky, say, this is what you need to be about. I responded to things that I really cared about. And for me, that came back to some of those questions. What draws the compassion out of me? What bothers me? Those actually stimulated better foundation for me to allocate decisions and say, I want to put my time, resources, anything into healing that, fixing that, curing that. And then it became a real obsession for me to give myself to that. But I also knew what to say no to. And in our world with endless distraction, mm -hmm. with so many options, mm -hmm. we live with everything is trying, vying for our attention and, you know, you see, pay attention to me, pay attention to me, like hey. my posts, like this, give money here, give money there. I knew what to say yes to and no to. I deliver more by doing less. And I was able to become more effective, if I could say that. Mm -hmm. And it says cliche -ish, but being selective. I narrowed my focus, but I broadened my reach. Hmm. Let me That's say that powerful. one more time. By saying, okay, this is what I'm going to be about. And that could be a long-term vision because I think it's good to have a long-term vision as you've discussed, we've even talked about. Then I also like to think of, okay, for the next three months, here's what I'm going to do. Because if it's three months, this is what I choose to do. I don't have to do anything. I don't, right. like, I don't like communicating the word I have to do anything. 
because then it makes me feel like I'm a slave. It's average man. language. I hate man. it. You get to. Oh. We don't say have to in our, our life. Are, I mean, like, and she'll <laughs> coach me out of it to be like, oh, I, I have to go to my son's game or like I have yeah. to go work out. She goes, eh, eh, eh. You you get to. And so it's just like, <laughs> it's a total different mentality shift where you're like, you're like, I have four daughters. I have a son. I get to go to a football game. I don't really, really like football, right. but I get it's to go good. watch my son compete. I get to go watch him laugh and, and have fun. And last night he threw a touchdown. It was the first time I've seen him do that. And uh, and so just changing the language, you know, because when you're talking about shooting arrows, you yeah. know, and guiding your children and how our, our words are arrows, um, that's one shift that, that I'm I'm really proud of of the shift that we've made as parents is the ar- arrows that we're shooting, the, the language that we're speaking in our house is a championship language. It's Even not an being around language. you guys, though, and watching the kids like, you know, earlier today, they're so alive and they're happy and free. They're not walking around concerned if they mess up, they do something off. Hey. You guys, and that might can be looked at as, well, yeah, we're just being parents and doing the best we can. But think to those kids, you're their freaking hero because you provided an environment where I am free to be me. I'm free to grow. You got two of your daughters down there, you know, pretending they're, you know, these great singers with a doll. You know what I'm saying? Your boy's out there. We turn up care. in this yeah. house, man. There but what you I love doubt. is it's an environment where there's passion energy. To you, that might not be like whatever. But to most people on the planet, they don't go home to families like that. I am proud of that, babe. Our, our, yeah. That's so significant. Our powerful. home is like a zoo. It's like a zoo, like a petting zoo. <laughs> And some People of the creatures, some of the other. creatures, a lot of bite. heavy petting. <laughs> some, of, some of the creatures, some of the creatures bite. You know, um, but yeah, man, that actually, I I accept that feedback, and that makes me feel good because that's one thing that I haven't always parented, especially my son, because earlier as a father, I was so attached to the result, and so I wanted to press upon my son my work ethic. Because to me, that's the only way to be successful is to work and grind and be obsessed. And I think this is my hypothesis, babe, and and you correct me or add your two cents. I feel like that kind of turned him off to the grind and to the obsession and to the hard work. And now he's starting to come back around to, to doing that, not because I make him do that, but because it's an ingredient. It's not the all in one ingredient, but it's an ingredient for greatness. And I don't care if my son wants to be the greatest pianist or, or football player or doctor. I don't care what he wants to do. Hard work and sacrifice and discipline is going to be required. And I feel like he's starting to, to step back into that. And so for me, I'm, I'm happy because I thought I ruined him there for a minute, (laughs) (laughs) but we're learning, you know, just like anybody else is. And that's why I I love to surround myself with people like you um, because you help you help me see a different side of things. And you also help help me to see me differently from the different things you shared with us earlier today and that you shared with us uh, on this podcast, man. You're you a powerful s- guy. You said something really cool we should hit real quick because this is relationally, I think that's the, really the quality of all of our existence is who you get to share life with and how much of you show up with and share how much of yourself you're willing to show. Mm-hmm. And you're worth showing, by the way. Please don't hide the lover in you. <laughs> I mean, that's the best part of you as a human. But he says, like, if my expectation for my daughter is so high because I'm so driven, Mm -hmm. then I'm grading her. Right. And then it sucks because if my expectation, my anticipation is so high, but my appreciation is so low, Mm. she feels like she can never catch up. And I I freaking sabotage it. And then her. But then I think I've done that. I've done my I can see it in my marriage. If I. If, if my marriage, when it's on fire and it's most passionate and it's most alive, my expectations are low in that relationship, but my appreciation and my celebration of her is so massively high. That's, that is, that's powerful we too because we actually had that happen to us earlier this week. Um, my wife has been, you know, we challenge ourselves. Um, we go to, to marriage counseling uh, about what, every two weeks. Mm-hmm. And every time we have awesome. a marriage counseling, Um, and it's not because we're having trouble in our marriage, but we're, you know, just like in fitness or just like in business, like I'm constantly wanting to improve. And so I want to improve the way that I show up for her. I want to become a better listener. I want to become more patient. I want to, I want to stretch into a a better person, a better dad, a better husband. And so we, we place these, we create these different stretches for ourselves. And, 
uh, one of her stretches was 30 days of posting on Instagram because she she likes to kind of live in her her comfort zone, her bubble. And there were two days in a row that she didn't post on Instagram. We actually had this conversation earlier today and she got defensive. I'm like, you didn't post for two days. I'm like, you're not committed. She goes, well, I was committed on this day. And then I had to no, like coach her into I said, I'm committed to having good posts. So if I didn't feel like I had anything to share, I wasn't committed right. to sharing but that, anything but that, that day. But the whole stretch is 30 days, 30 I didn't posts. Know, I didn't know it was 30 days in a row. Okay, well, now that we have we that got a new clarity, 30 day, we got a new 30 day challenge. Right, does that mean we're starting the 30 days back over? Let's get it on. Maybe everybody should try So are you telling me that days of you live with me and these gratitude. five complete maniac children that you don't have something to post about? I'm sure I do. Is, this ain't a library. Right. So, okay. The thing that you said, though, I do that with my son. We actually talked about this. My nephew made his basketball team. And his mom like put up this Facebook post. It was like, he made the basketball team. This is so amazing. And I'm like, he made the basketball team. Like, of course they make the basketball He's team. A, his last name's Weatherford. Like, he better make that basketball what team. Are you, what are like, you that's what I'm thinking. About? Like, you know, I, expectation. So my for expectation me, for my yes. nephew right. is extraordinarily high because I know team. how capable my genetic lineage is, <laughs> you know what no, I mean? mind you, I mean, I have no idea. But they sell, the point is that, they, that they she celebrated, celebrated it. it. They celebrated that. And my son, I have never, like, called anybody and been like, Ace made the basketball team. Because Ace has always made the team. Ace has always made, not, like, the team, like, the best team. Right, the A team, the, the A team. team. You know, like, the developmental team. Like, he's going to make the best team. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, when you just said that, like, That's I powerful. always set that expectation That's here. Powerful. So, and I don't appreciate the fact he always freaking makes it. Okay, if you did, let's just say, because we're oh all guilty of this, so you're not in the only boat here, so we're human here. Yeah. So if we could we celebrate a lot more? Oh, yes. Could we oh. find one thing where, oh, like yeah. if kids come to the table or you're with your boyfriend, could you just choose to celebrate one thing and just make an event, even be freaking fun and outrageous? Is there one thing every day we could just celebrate? Yes. Yeah. For sure. We How need, much richer We get to life. do that more. Yeah. We don't need to. We get to do that R- more. Life would be much... Yeah. Life would be like... I could take it to the next level too. Yeah. I was thinking of when you were saying that right there, like, oh my gosh, there's there's so many things to celebrate that we just chose to overlook. Well, that's not as a big event as that big. Because right. there's an expectation. The expectation is like... and But how... So this is where I struggle though. Like, I feel like my son has always been here, right? So like... In some ways, he set the expectation level himself. Like, I mean, I did it, but like, he's always You've done You've done that. the same thing for me too, though. But like, you always yeah. come through for me. So I don't celebrate you or show gratitude when you do like amazing things in our business because you've always done them since, since you entered into being involved in it. And so I don't, I don't, I don't do a good job of celebrating you for all the amazing things you do for our family, for our business, for me, because my expectation levels of you are so high because I know you're so powerful and you're so capable. Um, so that, that's, that, that part right there is going to be a major takeaway from me. Yeah. Um, that was, that was deep, man. I think life just becomes so much better too. And it releases the tension. Like everyone always carries in this expectation and let's love win. Mm -hmm. And I did this little thing back about three years ago. I started asking myself a question and it really helped me throughout my day. Because when you're passionate, you're a leader, you're a driver, you're trying to take your health, you're taking charge of your money, you're taking charge of management, you're taking whatever. I started asking myself this question, what does love demand of me today? One question. What does love demand or require of me today? I found that one question that was able to measure showed how much I was able to give, appreciate, love people. It would show me some days, man, you didn't show up with love today. You were... Your life was more about lust because lust takes love gives. Everywhere you went today, mm. it was about what you can get, what you can accumulate. Too. And mm. then I said, okay, well, what would love require? So if I show up here, what does love do? I want to find a way to enrich. I want a way to listen. I want a way to care. I want a way, no pretense. Right. What does love require tonight when I show up? Well, I could say, well, I'm tired. I give a bunch of BS, bullshit excuses. Mm. But the reality is I can choose how I'm going to show up. Yeah. Mm. And I thought about that when you start saying, like, what does love require? You show up with so many more creative ways to change an atmosphere, an environment. It could be a soft word that cools down someone that's bothered. It could be something to lift somebody. It could just be celebration, playful. It could be sexual. It could be whatever. Mm-hmm. But the idea that 
love showed up and won. Mm -hmm. Fear yeah. did it. It frees people. And then like, you know, even on a level like that, think about people that are parents like us in the room. Like your son is a stellar athlete. He, he's kicking butt. But then like you say, oh my gosh, you know, I really appreciate the way you give so much detail, the way you treat people and how much respect you show people, how honorable he you is, are. He's such a good boy. You know, like, he oh my gosh. So then he boy. thinks of himself, not just what his performance. And yeah. this is something you've talked about so vulnerably, which I appreciate. It's like, I am somebody, not what I do something. I am somebody. Right. Look at how I showed up. And then he rises to your level of confession. My life, right. my life has just changed because of this conversation. Yeah, the way that I would parent completely has changed. And yeah, just showing up in the world. Because it is how you show up. And you can change someone so quickly just by how you show up for them. Babe, did I tell you you were going to love Rex? Mm-hmm. Did You're I win? good man, dude. You're a good man. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. You are a good man. <laughs> I'm a good people. Um, all right, man. You inspire so, so, me. So I want to say that because yeah, I, appreciate I think that, I've man. been, no, I've been tracking for a while. Cause I, here's the real, the real backload story was I was having conversations with these powerful people and they're all talking behind your back. And that was really the truth. I told you that when I met you, I'm like, people go, Hey, Hey, you gotta meet this guy, Steve. Have you met Steve Weatherford? You, well, no, 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 you've talked to Steve Weatherford. You gotta meet Steve Weatherford. Cause see Steve, Steve Weatherford, Steve, Steve Weatherford. it's amazing. When I you was hear hearing the same chatter though from you. They chatter behind and it was always about the quality of people. So it's just neat. This is a really cool moment. Yeah. No, Great I, you, and you know what it is, is um, it's energies attracting. It really is like people that have that. a heart to, to serve others end up getting served themselves, you know? So I'm in uh, such a powerful season of growth um, in my, mm -hmm. in my personal life and in my family life that I've been so intrinsically focused, like of the humans that live in this house, including myself, that I haven't really gone out to, to network or to, to meet new people, but more amazing people have come into my life in the last four months. Right, babe. Yeah. That, and I'm not even trying, I'm not out going to like, you know, events to meet people and like putting myself in a good position to make good friends. They're just coming into my life and it's, it's powerful how God's working in my life to bring powerful relationships into my life, not to further my business, not to further my personal development, but to, to further like my soul. But people feel that I told you like people were co contacting me from other countries, from Canada and different places that are tuning in. This is before I met you yeah. into this podcast that I'm yeah. actually on today, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And they're talking about when I go there, I feel like I can become there. It wasn't like here, give me the flashy, 10 steps to making more money. Here's the right. 10 steps to being this. There's all these cool insights from your guests and some of the things you're having on here that are improving different qualities of people's lives. But what's freaking cool is people feel like they can become here and they can be. Yeah. And that's what that's the powerful. feedback was Thank that you, I even man. got from people. I told Steve out of, you know, some people that I was talking to in Canada, some people I was talking to in different places in the U.S. They said, I like coming there because I, I feel like I, I just fit, like I fit in. I can see it. That, feel, that feels so good to hear that. Uh, because That's my people. Th that was my vision for this podcast. Wasn't This was going to be the first project that I ever did in my whole life that wasn't going to be about Steve Weatherford self-promotion. Like This is the first place that I was going to allow people to meet Steve. You know, And that's why I wanted my wife to be a part of it because she is such a big part of who Steve is. Um, granted, she supported Steve Weatherford, but she was standing behind me and, and pushing me and supporting me. And now I feel like figuratively I'm pulling her from behind me to stand next to me to lead this charge because she's such a powerful woman. Mm -hmm. And and it's been magical, like magical to look at the comments that people leave on these different podcast episodes and the reviews that people leave because they're so genuine and they're so authentic. You can tell they're so heartfelt from people from you know, 75 years old to, to 16 years old and, and the things that we share on here and the guests that we have on are like, it sounds cliche and douchey, but it's changing <laughs> people's lives. And it's like, yeah. I've received a couple personal messages, um, direct messages on Instagram. It's saving people's lives. I got a direct message that somebody was, was contemplating uh, taking their own life because they had done all these amazing things in their life and, and nothing was filling that void and they were filling the void with drugs and alcohol the same way that I did. And to receive that 
message that one life was saved because of of my wife's willingness to share her life finally and my willingness to to share my real life and the real vulnerable person i've always hidden that i was sensitive and emotional and and that i cry i mean i think we've done like two or three uh podcast episodes where i've like cried during it Um, and i'm okay with that because i think it's important as you referenced earlier the alpha man like you were the alpha man and and i am the alpha man but people like the alpha man never shows compassion or sensitivity or vulnerability but that's what a real alpha man is is somebody who can showcase all of the human emotions and be proud of it um so i'm i'm really proud to hear you say that man so before before we end the show because i could do this for like two more hours i want to acknowledge you for um when i think of you like when you call my phone or you text message me the first thing i i think of in my mind is that you're connected like I feel like God has a direct line from him to you and he's, he's speaking and doing through you and your body. So I want to acknowledge you from that. I want to acknowledge you uh, for the anointing and the permission that you give other people. And I want to acknowledge you for your generosity because there's a lot of things uh, that you could be doing with the talents that God's given you, but you're making a real, genuine, raw, authentic change in this world, man. So it's I'm blessed to call your Thank friend, you. man. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. That means a lot. I get Before we get out of here, um, I would love for you to, to pray us out, man. Yeah, you let me have that privilege? Please. Yeah, no matter anybody's background, we're going to pray something really cool, and God's going to answer it. Because I do want to say for every person that ever listened, people say, you know, what do I got to do to get God to bless me to do anything? I think God only made human beings so he can love them. People play so hard to get. Why do we play so hard to get between us and love? You know, and... Tina Turner's old song, What Has Love Got to Do With It? But man, when you understand how much he loves a person and what his love would do for you, he wants to see people live up, live high, live out their best self. So let me pray. Lord, I thank you that God, the Bible says you're a great father and good things come from you. I thank you for every person listening today. And I thank you that you made them unique and different. You didn't make a carbon copy of them. Lord, you threw away the mold when you made them. I thank you they're wonderfully made. You put great destiny and purpose inside of them. That craving for destiny and intimacy, I thank you, God, starts in you because love created it all. I pray you'd open every person's heart and mind to understand how much you love them and your love would remove the sense of failure, hurt, and heal, bring healing to them emotionally, physically, mentally. I pray your love would give people a brand new start. I thank you there's forgiveness and grace in your love. And I thank you for provision and favor because destiny comes out of your love. And I pray that, Lord, destiny would be awakened in people. Dreams, passions, I pray, difference inside of people would become alive and activated and they would align with it. Give people the courage to make wise decisions, Lord, and not choose comfort over courage and over, Lord, uh, authentic leadership in their life. But I pray they would raise the bar just as Lord the Weatherfords have and decide they're going to live life by design, not by default. And I pray your super would come on their natural and these next six months would be magical, marked by your miracles. I thank you for being faithful to do it, God. And thanks for answering my prayer. And I pray you bless every person listening to me. In Jesus, your awesome name. Amen. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop talking. Thank Rex Crane and thank you guys for tuning in. I love you. Down the field, Hollywood! Let me think about that one. 77 yards! Whoa! Who is this kid? Mr.